Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 800. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is April 25th, 2023. All right, we're going to do the GAFCON follow-up show. It's going to be quite a show. Uh, first, some logistics. George is back in Florida. You had a great trip to Kigali, Rwanda. You're back. I am in Wisconsin. We're uh, uh, going to spend this week with a, uh, a celebration of life service for Dad at the end of the week. So keep me in your prayers because apparently I've been nominated to MC it. So that should be a lot of fun, I, I guess. Well, whatever. George, how are you doing? Welcome back. I'm doing wonderful. I had uh, the time of my life. It was a, and I've been, a, it, how should I describe it? Um, it was a time of joy, exhaustion, hunger, and joy. Uh, I don't like goat meat. And uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, are you going to get fish, chicken, or goat meat? Did I get, yeah, did, I was serving sirloin in, Rugu- in Rwanda. And the know. thing is, you know, the fish is always the same fish, Nile perch from Lake Victoria. Yeah. So I ate a lot of chicken and beans, uh, but I just couldn't bring myself to eat goat, and there's only so much fish I can eat. I'm, I'm being silly, but actually, that's all true. But <laughs> GAFCON is a life changing experience for the Anglican world and the Christian world, and it was a life-changing experience for George Conger. And I know that sounds like hyperbole, but it is true. The world, the church world, has changed because of GAFCON 4 in Kigali. Uh, Will we see this change this Sunday at your church? Probably not. But it has, the the plates have moved under the continents. They're shifting. Uh, It's a new world out there. Okay, well, this is the first uh, uh, show we've taped since Easter. Uh, we took uh, the week of Easter off because, well, you were exhausted and I was tired and traveling. And so, happy Easter, George. Happy Easter. And did you get your taxes done? I got my taxes done. Uh, I usually put them in at 11 o'clock the night they're due. And then I, uh, I write my big check because I'm not the person who, who loans the IRS or the government any money. So I'm usually writing a check with four digits, and it's very uncomfortable. But, you know, I I don't get fined, and I pay at the last minute. That's the kind of guy I am. Uh, And so you're back here in the States, and right before you left, uh, the Church of England has basically scuttled to the mothership. Uh, Justin Welby has, as the captain of that ship, has watched the mothership and uh, been a scuttled. It's, it's sunk to the bottom of the ocean. And so GAFCON is meeting under this uh, idea that what do we do now? How can we help? Do we want to be helpers? Or is there a new platform now for GAFCON? And I think I want to start with that uh, to talk about the transition of GAFCON uh, over the last uh, many years because they have a new focus and it's no longer political. It always was political. It always was a response to what was happening over here in America. It was a response to Catherine Jeffers Shorey. It was a response to Michael Curry. It was a response to Justin Welby. They even invited him over to uh, Nairobi and said, explain yourself. But now GAFCON is like, we can do politics all day long, or we can offer Jesus to the world. That's a change, George. Major change. And we saw that on the opening night. Uh, the... Uh... Archbishop of the Anglican Church in North America, Foley Beach, who's the chairman of GAFCON, gave a very good speech to the Congre- to the conference. And a lot of the coverage will focus on his criticisms of the Church of England about the things that you mentioned, approving same-sex blessings and how the uh, this was a betrayal of the Christian faith, a uh, deviation from scripture, and so on and so forth. But that was only about 10% of his speech, and that was used as an example in his speech, was about reconciliation, repentance, uh, renewal, uh, reform, reorganization. Foley Beach gave a sermon, and repentance and reconciliation were the key words there, that we need to repent before God, not just repent 
and call upon the Church of England to repent or the Episcopal Church, but we need to repent and we need to reconcile, not with one another or with a fallen, broken world or with churches that have rejected the gospel, but reconcile with God our Father in heaven. Amen. And this was an open, loving, kind, powerful. Now, if you're a diehard left-wing Episcopalian, it wouldn't have been kind because you were used as an example of what you need to repent of. Sure. But but members of GAFCON were also called to repent for judging their neighbors and basically not acting out against abortion, uh, adultery, uh, child uh, uh, abuse. In other words, Bishop, uh, Archbishop uh, Foley, you know, said that, you know, if we just focus on one sexual sin out of many sexual sins, we're losing the gospel. We're just becoming uh, hard-nosed Puritans who look down at everybody. We well, need to no, begin it, to... That, that's an important point. The, the 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 emphasis of Gafcon cannot be looking at the splinter in somebody else's eye, and when they, when they clearly would have logs in their own eyes, and mm -hmm. we always approach it. We're better than you. You can't. That's not how Gafcon goes forward. Gafcon has to go forward in truth. Absolutely. And then his speech was followed by Ben Quashi, the general secretary of Gafcon's speech, and Ben Quashi laid out an ambitious program. Uh, and called for a decade of discipleship, evangelism, and mission over the next 10 years. And later in the conference, they announced a $10 million fundraising campaign. Now, what do they want this money for? For the next meeting? To fund lawyers? To do this and that? No. GAFCON, and GAFCON did not spend five days beating up on the Church of England, unlike the first GAFCON, which spent uh, a week beating up on the Episcopal Church. GAFCON spent five days on all of those things. Discipleship, evangelism, mission. I have listened to Rico Tice give a speech about Christianity Explored and his experiences with bringing the gospel to a pagan world in England. I, I, as I was saying, said to you, Kevin, before the show, my shoulders are sore because I packed so many books into my backpack so I wouldn't be overweight in the airplane coming back. And it, well, this these bookend speeches, the theology of Foley of the Foley Beach laying out the theological program and the agenda of GAFCON as a mission agency for the Anglican world, changing individuals, changing churches by calling people for repentance and reconciliation and renewal and rebirth and reorganization, bookended with Ben Quashi's youth work, biblical education social outreach, uh, Christian, essentially Christian humanitarianism, but not like, well, we need mosquito nets and this and that. Nothing wrong with mosquito nets, but we need to teach the gospel. And to do that, we need these resources to get a Bible into the hands of all these people. We need to raise up seminarians in Mount Madagascar or Pakistan who can, you know, can't even afford pencils and paper. And so this was... You had a great analogy, Kevin, about it, because GAFCON is no longer going to carry the political banner in the fight against what is called the Canterbury Communion. Mm -hmm. It is going to be a mission agency, a mission organization for the Anglican Communion. And yeah, it's, it's GAFCON no is not the, surrendering that to Justin Welby. Right. It's no longer the black ops. We're not here just to be a political organization, to complain about what's going on in the world. We're here to be missional. And that is a big change. And we saw that uh, 10 years ago with the American Anglican Council, who used to be the black ops trying to uh, make people aware of what's happening within the Episcopal Church and the liberal provinces around the world. Uh, they would show up with the Lam at the Lambeth conferences and stuff like that and provide a support staff for the Orthodox primates. You know, so they, they knew, knew what's going on, that they all had the same documents in front of them, that they would, was aware of what's happening on in the whole Lambeth uh conference and uh, campus area and they did that well but there's a time when you need to stop fighting the politics and become an organization that is uh, glorifying uh, God the Father and they did that so well they now train bishops on what it means to be a bishop 
If you're coming out of uh, uh, places in uh, Africa and Asia and uh, Europe, you don't have a great idea of what it means to be a bishop because you don't see your bishop that often. Here, it's a great training provided by the American Anglican Council. And this is the, the great transition now for GAFCON. Ga well, GAFCON as an Episcopalian. Great... Yeah, go ahead. As an Episcopalian, not seeing your bishop that often, that's a plus, Kevin. <laughs> that's a but plus. That's an unusual circumstance. <laughs> no, but it, it, that's a good point, though. Uh, and so we're at this point of transition and um, doing what we're supposed to do, spread the good news. And we can still do that in the political turmoil because the Global South has now said they're going to do things differently. Yeah. A little bit of background. The Global South Fellowship of Anglicans formed about five years ago. And in 2018, they produced the Cairo Covenant. Mm -hmm. That's five years ago. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there have been talks about these being rival groups. Well, before the start of this meeting, uh, the Global South and GAFCON, its primates sat down and met together, and they actually had their formal meeting on the Tuesday or Wednesday of the conference towards the beginning, mm -hmm. before the, while the communique was in the drafting stage. And sources tell me amongst the primates that there was really... Well, first I'll talk about the private things I was told, then I'll repeat the public things I were told. <laughs> GAFCON was saying, let's go with the Steve Knoll program. Professor Steve Knoll has put sort of put forward a program that I'll call the United Anglican Communion proposal, which was to set up a parallel Anglican communion uh, for those who share common Christian faith and orthodoxy and sort of recreate the wheel. And immediately go on the offensive and attack the Church of England and Justin Welby and try to pull down that house of cards. The Global South primate said, no, no, we're, we're, we're not ready to do that. Um, we uh, don't want to do that. And here's some of the thinking. Um, let's, let's bring up the example of the Church of England. Both the Global South primates, and that's people like Tito Zavala of Chile, uh, James Wong of the Indian Ocean, uh, Sami uh, Shahada of Alexandria, um, uh, Justin Badiarama. Um, they're, they're saying, um, look, some of us in our provincial constitutions specifically say we identify ourselves by our relationship with the Sea of Canterbury. And before we can break with the Sea of Canterbury, we must alter our constitutions. Uh, ben Kwashi spoke to me about this, and he said, during colonial days, when these churches were being formed, they all had British lawyers write their constitutions. And the Church of Nigeria, if, if our viewers can remember this from episode 200 or 300. 200, yeah, they broke. <laughs> we, talked, we talked about how the Church of Nigeria was rewriting Rowan Williams out of their constitution. They would no longer be identified by their relationship with Canterbury, but by their relationship to the Book of Common Prayer, the ordinal, and the foundational, and, and the, the homilies and the foundational. 30, Anglican 30 articles. Yeah. articles. Yeah. We, the Church of Nigeria was becoming a confessional church based on the Anglican formularies, not a church that identified itself by being in relation with the Sea of Canterbury. So Nigeria can tomorrow break with Canterbury and all they have to do is say, fine, we're done. Many and many African, other African and Asian countries have to redo their foundational documents and it takes a process to do this. They have to have, if it were the Episcopal Church, we have to have two general conventions to do yeah. the constitution, which uh, could be up to six years. So there's not time uh there's not that, that you can't just do it tomorrow everybody's agreed it needs to be done but the difference is how do we do it and second and i'm going to translate it, this from an african sort of analogy to a george conger american an analogy and i'll phrase it in this way the church of england is like a drunk walking down the streets at three in the morning and if the gafcon came up 
and knife this drunk in the middle of the night between put stuck a knife in his shoulder blades and I think you mean glo- the you, you mean the global south yeah if the global south stuck yeah. a knife into the back of the archbishop of canterbury and the church of england as it's staggering down the street then it'll be blamed for its death and everybody will say oh you're the villain if you'd only been faithful if you only blah 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 well if you let the drunk keep walking down the street somebody else is going to stab it in 10 minutes or it's going to drop dead of heart failure and then you can rush in and help rescue what can be rescued so the global staff is at the opinion that the church of england's days are numbered whether it's as an established church or as a Mm -hmm. functioning church how many how many you know at i've heard i don't know the exact number but a massive amount of the funds say for the diocese of london and a massive amount of the electoral rolls are moving into these churches that are saying we can't recognize you sarah malali for what you're doing uh on gay marriage why and the global south thinking is let the church of england collapse by itself and then we can come in and help those who need to be and want to be helped now, from a press perspective, we kind of think the Church of England is done, it's all over. The Global South says they're not dead yet. I hate to use the Monty Python phrase, but not dead yet. They're close, they're stumbling, they're drunk about to die of liver cancer or liver failure. But, you know, the, there's that reality, it's not time to go in yet. Now, they don't get in this place by just observation. There's obviously some prayer discernment in this, George. I think one of the things that marked this conference for me was a a desire to seek the guidance of the Holy Spirit in the deliberations. Um, Yes, there's always political log rolling and global GAFCON wants this, Global South wants that. But at the end of the day, as James Wong said publicly, our meeting with the GAFCON primates was a happy meeting. I don't hear that word happy at these sort of upper level gatherings. There's always somebody who is upset or somebody who's mad or somebody of this or that. They were all happy because they were resting in the leading of the spirit. There was no sense of we've got to do this, we got to do that. It just now it may be presumptuous of me to claim that I can tell when the spirit is leading. Time will tell, of course, the Gamaliel test. You know, if it's of God, it'll soon show itself. We'll be there. Mm -hmm. But there was a conscious decision made by participants to see this through. Now, that's the top level. Let's look at some of the delegations. Calvin Robinson represented the Free Church of England. Calvin gave a really great speech. Man is going to be, if he's not already, one of the greatest British apologists for the gospel of his generation. Um, But I digress. Calvin and his friends want action now. The Church Society, Legatus, uh, Church of England Evangelical Council, Bishop Rob Monroe, who was the Bishop of Ebb's Fleet, which is now the Evangelical Flying Bishop, they all are saying, look, it's bad in England. Don't get us wrong, but there's still time for the bishops to pull the plug on this living in love and faith fiasco. So let's hold off washing our hands completely of the Church of England um, and just see what the future brings and pray with us and work with us and help us. Um, So there were two views. I asked uh, Foley Beach, will there be any flying bishops from GAFCON and Foley is also treasurer or vice chairman of the Global South. He's Something one of those. Like that, yeah. Will there be any flying bishops going to England? And Foley said, no, this is not a repeat of ACNA. Um, ACNA was one time, one place, and America is different from all other places. It's better. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in England, no, we're not going to send in bishops. Um, we are going to support people. We're going to encourage people. But if people feel they need a bishop, there's the Anglican network in Europe. There's already an alternative Anglican jurisdiction in England in the British Isles. And we can revisit this if uh, things get nasty or harsh, but stay in the Church of England, 
continue to fight, continue to pray, continue to take the steps to protect yourselves. Uh, and for many churches, that means don't pay. Don't send in your, your share to the diocese. Put it into a good steward's trust to help other less fortunate uh, churches that need money. Um, and this is a notably positive outlook. Now, some would say, oh, well, they're just kidding themselves. The Church of England's on an irreversible course towards damnation. Well, one of them, I think the one speech that received a standing ovation was from Keith Sinclair, who I believe is the former Bishop of Birkenhead. Mm -hmm. Keith has long, Keith, I would describe as a high churchman, evangelical high churchman. He's not charismatic. He's not a low church conservative evangelical. He's more in my stream of evangelicalism. So for an American, you would recognize him as an evangelical. For an Englishman, you would say, eh, he doesn't look like these other guys. Well, that being said, he gave a very detailed, passion-felt speech about what the bishops of the Church of England had done and General Synod had done. And he was moved to tears at one point, and he wept by its abandonment of the clear, undoubted words of Christ and 2,000 years of Christian witness and testimony. This was, and he received a standing ovation from the group. Um, so there are leaders like Keith Sinclair. He's now retired. Um, there were four British bishops, English bishops, I should say, that I saw there. Three were retired, and Keith and Rob Monroe, the flying bishop of Ebb's fleet, was the only serving bishop I saw. The other three were Julian Henderson and the former flying bishop, Rod Thomas, and, of course, uh, uh, Keith Sinclair. But at Lambeth... Uh, I was not there, but one of our contacts there, Paul Eddy. Well, I shouldn't have said his name, but now I did, so there you go. Hold on, I, I can bleep that out. Well, let's see if Paul complains <laughs> after. <Play> okay. <laughs> w w wish, uh, watched Keith Sinclair being told off by a staffer of Lambeth Palace, where you must do this, you must do that, the Archbishop requires you to do this. Um, I'm not breaking any confidences, this is in public. Yeah. Partially designed to embarrass Bishop Sinclair in front of others, um, in my opinion. Uh, but the uh, so it it's not a surprise that there weren't English bishops flocking there. But I think they'll be very interested to hear what happened from their clergy and lay leaders who are returning to tell them the good news. Hmm. So, had out the whole conference, but you got to go places. Uh, Kigali is a wonderful city. It's not like uh, going downtown Webster. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about uh, your, your trip in, to Kigali, or in Kigali. Well, this will date me, of course, but if you were a child and read the, the Babar, the Elephant books, sure. Kigali looks like Celesteville, mm -hmm. a French colonial town. All little red roofs, beautifully what kept streets, sidewalks, culverts, palm trees, and gardens. And Kigali is Rwanda's run by a benign dictator, and he requires you to make you must. Uh, a few years ago, he he read a purpose driven life. Uh, oh, what's his name? <laughs> Rick. Warren. Rick Warren. <laughs> and he had Rick Warren out to Rwanda, and he said, yeah. got, Rwanda is going to be a purpose driven country, and people have to voluntarily give time to cleaning up the streets and making sure the sidewalks. And so, this is an immaculate city. Immaculate. No trash, no beggars, no bums. Um, it's hard to think this is ever a Belgian colony because the signs are in two languages English and the local local language mm -hmm. um the people are very friendly at kigali ah oh, it's like going to baltimore or you know gary indiana you just feel grimy by the time you're done it's a sprawling city with huge slums and everything kigali's yeah. not like that no i can I mean, see why 
this was a more favored colonial place to live because it's about five, 6,000 feet up. Um, it rain, it's like Florida in that it rains every day at three o'clock. Must be humid. But unlike, but unlike Florida, it doesn't just sit around in puddles. It flows down the hill into Lake Victoria and then down the White Nile, then down the Nile out into the Mediterranean. Um, it, I was there during the celebration at the 29th anniversary of the start of the genocide. And I went to the Genocide Museum and I happened to go there when there were some college and school trips going and all these young children there and also older people and sort of standing there with thousands of Rwandans. And I, I don't look Rwandan, so I could sort of see I was a foreigner. Um, I wasn't a Yankee or anything, thank goodness. Yeah. But uh, yeah. learning of the details of the Rwandan genocide through their genocide museum. Last Jerusalem conference, I went to Vad Yashem, the Holocaust Museum. So I guess what's left, uh, the going to Cambodia to see the Pol Pot genocide. I mean, I'm running out of genocides. Well, Armenia, of course, but yes, I'm being more silly tough. and dumb. Yeah. But I, I witnessed that. Uh, I wanted to go see gorillas in the mist, but gorillas, it's like Florida. Gorillas get up early. They're like old people in Florida and about... <laughs> Two o'clock in the afternoon, they're fast Nap asleep. Time. Sure, and you go, and you know, you do your business, and then go take the bus out. Uh, uh, you know, the few, few hour, several hours bus trip, uh, <laughs> out to see them, and they're all sitting around, and it's like, I could have gone to the Bronx Zoo and seen more active things, but I got the t-shirts for my children, so that's all that counted. Awesome. But Kevin, I have to tell you, most of my time was spent in fellowship with other people. The delegates were broken into, we had assigned seating at the conference. Mm -hmm. And I fortunately had an aisle seat. Um, the Rwandans are very tall people, by the way. Uh, if you ever saw the movie as a child, King Solomon's Minds, Mines, oh, yeah. starring Deborah, Deborah yeah. Carr yeah. and sure. Farley Granger. Yeah. Yes, this is where the seven foot Africans come from. All right. Wow. Okay. They are really tall people. Not mm -hmm. just the occasional pituitary freak, but you know. No, the even the the Archbishop of Rwanda is tall. In, in my okay, in my world, he's tall. So, his daughter Erica, uh, who I met, who is the head of volunteers, uh, Erica, is my height, and I'm six four. Mm -hmm. She's my size, and she's not freakish in any way. I, that sounds terrible. I hope, hate to no. say that, but perfectly normally, they, they're normally, just that big. Yeah, yeah, but. And the Hutus are, are well, the, the Tutsis sort of came out of the north and are mm -hmm. more kin to the Ethiopian peoples and the Sudanese. The Hutus came from the south and are more Bantu. And there's a third group of people that you don't hear much about, and they're called the Twa, who are the pygmies. So That's they're right. the tallest people in Africa and the shortest people in Africa all live in the same country. And part of the genocide was that Tutsis, for the most part, are immediately recognizable. Uh, different aquiline features, different heights, lighter skins. It, yeah. That being said, it was a wonderful trip. But I, I just want to get back to Gavcon because why was this earth changing? Why was this life changing? Why is this a moment, momentous shift? Well, the churches there represent about 80% of the people in the pews in the Anglican world. There were 330 bishops present. Oh, well, there were 660 at Lambeth 2022. Yes, but there were about 140 American bishops representing 600,000 people in church on Sunday. Yeah. Um, so you don't do it by the number of bishops. You do it by the number of people from the churches they represent. Oh, well, not everybody who belongs to these GAFCON churches supports their agenda. That's true. And not everybody who belongs to the Episcopal Church supports its agenda. Yeah. <laughs> In fact, there were two registered Episcopalians at this conference. Who, Me, you, and who, you and who else? Professor Ashley Null. He's still Good an choice. Episcopalian resident Good in the choice. Diocese of Western Kansas. Wow. Um, but the spirit is moving the anglican world to break free of its colonial 
heritage, its colonial past. Nothing wrong with the past. The past is what it is. But to allow the mechanisms that the British used to control an empire that folded a long time ago to persist in a church, as Foley Beach said in his opening address, is essentially unconscionable. Right now, Britain has a Hindu prime minister. Good for them. But if that man, it, on paper, can appoint the secular leader of the Anglican world. How does that make any sense? But and, but th that's exactly the problem. That is exactly the problem. That That is the colonialism in its essence, is having the powerful leadership make the rules for everybody else. And you just heard the complaints of archbishops said we can't quite just jump ship because we'd have to change all the documents written by the British government and British lawyers. You know, we, we can't and, just jump yet. Now, some newspapers, well, it hasn't been really extensively covered. In America, Fox News had an online article and the Wall Street Journal had a piece by Francis Roca, who's their Catholic correspondent. Sure. But, you know, unlike in the past, I would wrote the ones for the Washington Post in the past for the previous GAFCONs, totally uninterested. But so the church press was there. Um, in fact, there were no secular reporters there the entire time. There was one guy from the Kigali Times, and the other was a local stringer for the Associated Press, and everybody else was church press. The Church Times didn't send anybody. The Church of England newspaper didn't send anybody. The Living Church had a guy. There was me. There was David Virtue. There was Jeff Walton. And then there were some English uh, representatives of English organizations like San and Doozy, Susie Leaf and so on sure. and so forth. And, I don't, and Australian uh, Dominic Steele and his friends, they, our friend David Old. There were church journalists, but there were no secular journalists. So this really hasn't percolated into the uh, uh, West, the conscious yet. But what is important is that, like the Church Times had an article, uh, Gafcon rejects all forms of Anglican authority. Well, that's not really true. Because what Gafcon rejected was the Archbishop of Canterbury, the primates meeting, the Anglican Consultative Council, and the Lambeth Conference as being the guiding principles of Anglicanism. Gafcon would say the authority of Anglicanism lies in the Bible and the Book of Common Prayer and the Ordinal and the 39 Articles. And when the Archbishop of Canterbury abandons the Anglican heritage he's been entrusted with, then we stick with the Anglican heritage. So what does this mean in practical terms? Uh, I was asked, uh, David Virtue asked the question at a press conference of Foley Beach. Well, what does it mean if, are you going to go to the next primates meeting? And Foley Beach said, well, if he calls a meeting, we're we're just not going to go. It, we don't, it's as if George Conger or Kevin Carlson called a primates meeting. We would probably have a little bit more response. Just saying. <laughs> well, we're not going to pay for you guys to fly <laughs> to Florida, but... The point is, it's not that we are negative, but rather we don't recognize your authority to do this. So the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, controls all four instruments of communion. The, he controls himself. Hopefully he does. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, at this point. The primates yeah. meeting, he summons. Yeah. The Lambeth Conference, he summons and he issues the invitations. He can invite people he wants to and doesn't invite others. Mm -hmm. You remember, he uh, was it 2008, he did not invite Gene Robinson, but he refused to invite Martin Menz, who was a validly consecrated bishop of the church in Nigeria. That's right. He was going to basically take uh, tit for tat. And so just uh, Rowan Williams could do that. And Rowan William, uh, Justin Welby did not invite Foley Beach, even though the majority of the Anglican world and the Act of Primates, because he didn't consider them Anglicans. Or Miguel Uchoa of Brazil and his church. We don't consider you the real Anglicans, even though Miguel's church is now bigger than the Anglican Episcopal Church of Brazil. It's the bigger of the two Anglican churches in Brazil. Yeah. And the uh, Anglican Consultative Council is led by a failed British uh, church politician, a woman who lost re-election to General Synod, but because it was Buggins' turn and she had been, uh, 
you know, appointed by Welby, uh, she became the 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 president of the Ang of the Anglican Consultative Council. And Welby chooses the general secretary, and Welby is the president is the chairman of the, oh, the chairman or president. He, he's the head of the show there. Now here's the thing: um, not the Episcopal Church has never recognized in its documents the authority of the Anglican Consultative Council or the authority of the primates meeting, or the authority of any of these things. We were the first church that defined ourselves by the Book of Common Prayer, not by the mm -hmm. Archbishop of Canterbury, because we had this little thing called the American Revolution. <laughs> Civil War. And re yeah. One of the things that, Revolution. Kevin, remember when we broke yeah. these stories about Kenneth Kieran, who was then General Secretary of the Anglican Consultative Council, fudging the books of the Anglican Consultative Council. They wanted to reorder how the ACC operated and met and they sent out things to all its members asking for permission for a vote to change the Constitution. And we talked to Greg Venables of South America. Greg, how did you guys vote? We never were asked. We talked to Henry Arambe. How did you guys vote? We were never asked. I looked through all the records of General Convention and the Executive Council. Not once did it ask. What happened? And I was told by somebody who used to be at the Anglican Consultative Council, who's a jolly friend of ours. And that's enough of a hint I'm going to give. I know who you're talking uh, about. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that uh, Kieran basically assumed unless you objected, you were in favor. So we have never voted as a church. The, not even the Episcopal Church has voted on changes to all these things. And if we were never asked to be part of it, we're just told how it's going to work by, by the Archbishop of Canterbury, how can we be said to be rebelling against something we were never part of except by somebody else's decision? Just because we sent people to the party doesn't mean we agree, you know, we give our th that we give them carte blanche. Sounds like colonialism. Yes. And it does. So what the one of the things the Kigali commitment has called for is a new Anglican structures of authority because the Canterbury centered ones are broken. If you want to have sort of buzzword phrases that we heard, there's a Canterbury communion and the Anglican communion. Mm -hmm. The Canterbury communion are at this stage, uh, England, Amer uh, US uh, Episcopal church, Anglican church of Canada, Anglican Ch Episcopal church of Brazil, church of mm -hmm. Scotland, church in Wales, Maybe some people I've left out. Um, those who have made affirmative decisions in favor of same-sex blessings and gay, mar and gay marriage and the ordination of gay and lesbian, non-celibate gay and lesbian clergy to the clergy or to the episcopate. Now, there are churches like Jerusalem in the Middle East that just do not want to be nailed down on this point. But... Jerusalem, for instance, the diocese put out a statement saying we disagree with the Di Church of England on the uh, whole gay stuff. And the, and the Global South is willing to live with ambiguity. They're willing to allow George Congers from the Episcopal Church and people from the Church of England to be in fellowship and to be in favor and to be part of this group, even though their provinces have gone astray. So it, so, well, then Justin Welby gave his response, which was, well, the, and that's just it. I mean, we, I, okay, we know what the Global South says. We know what Gafcon says. I'm waiting to hear either uh, no noise at all from the Church of England. You could play it and say nothing happened. Doesn't doesn't affect us anyway. Or you could write a great, we're sorry, you took us out of context. Of course, we didn't do what you said or do. Or what did they say, George? And 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 uh, you can't make us. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it was a childish response, a petulant, spoiled child saying that, well, only the instruments of communion can change the instruments of communion. Well, friends, remember, the Lambeth Conference in 1998 turned down the instruments of communion. That's right. They're they as official as you want them to be. Mm -hmm. um, our friend uh, uh, A.S. Haley 
said the Episcopal Church is more like the Ivy Leagues in the sense that it's a loose association than it is like the Catholic Church, where you join the Ivy Leagues to play football badly. Uh, but just because Harvard does something doesn't mean Yale has to do something. That's right. The Anglican Communion is sort of like that. Uh, and GAF, Global South Fellowship of Anglicans, is coming back with a covenant proposal, just like you and I saw go down in flames in Jamaica, in Jamaica, Kingston, yeah. when we went to that ACC meeting. They're bringing it back, and we'll see what comes of it. But yeah, we're that, moving to confessional Anglicanism. Which is going to be good, because hopefully over the time, maybe it may take 15 years, provinces will change their documents. It says, we're not defined by the Sea Canterbury. Here's what defines and, us. And here's what defines our relationship with other provinces. Yeah. And see, here's a funny thing. The Stephen Cottrell, or Cottrell, whether you're English or American, however you want to pronounce it, gave his Diocese of York presidential address on Saturday, the day after GAFCON closed. And GAFCON couldn't have done a better job writing its speech itself than Stephen Cottrell did. He said, it's not orthodoxy, doctrinal orthodoxy, that is important. It's love. That's what John Lennon said. Yes, it's emotionalism. <sighs> it's how you feel, man, not what you believe. Not the content of the, your faith, not the content of your character, but how you feel about it. All you Which, need is love. And Justin Welby, one of the things Gafcon said is we cannot live with there are two valid ways here, pro-gay and anti-gay. Mm -hmm. and that we can live in some sort of tension and just pretend it doesn't happen. We're not doing that. Um, because it's either true or it's false. We're not into this postmodern nonsense that it could be true for you, but false for me. Um, truth is not rel relative, nor is it relational. Truth is either yes or no. And Cottrell gave this asinine thing saying it's how you feel about it. It's the love that guides you. He doesn't bother to define love. He doesn't bother to take it past how you feel about it. But this is amateur hour of the most egregious and atrocious types. I mean, Cottrell would always be teased by my English friends as being a bit of a lightweight, but man, this guy must be floating around near the ceiling. He's got nothing in his shoes holding him to the ground. But here, and here's the difference, almost a generational difference. The Church of England is in the mess it's in, and Justin Welby is in the mess it's in because of the lightweight theology they've been using. Rowan Williams would never have gotten into this mess. He was able to avoid it through uh, schism, sh uh, schematics, whatever he used to avoid it, he did. Cottrell and uh, Welby are stuck in it because they have, they have inch deep theology. Well, know? here's the thing: Rowan Williams would give us a, a, an agreement that none of us could understand. So we <laughs> <Yeah>, said, <no. laughs> "Look, <laughs> what, uh, Ke Kevin? Where's my thesaurus? I don't understand <laughs> this. You know, that's, that's a fourteen yeah. syllable word. I don't get it. You know, <laughs> I mean, Rowan Williams is a deep thinker, but he's not a clear thinker. Okay, mm -hmm. um, at least I don't find him clear or lucid." Um, but you're right, this is not a mistake Rowan Williams would have made. Mm -hmm. And so we're, and here's the thing, this, there, here's the opportunities and things that are out there. Who does the Roman Catholic Church do dialogue with? Yeah. With a committee formed by the Anglican Consultative Council that represents, who, gosh, God knows who? 12% or is it, of the communion? Or, who do the uh, Russian Orthodox talk to? Who will they listen to if Justin Welby says one more time, oh, you are so mean for invading Ukraine? I don't doubt that, that they're mean. But, you know, will the Orthodox give Welby the time of day? Or will they return a phone call from the new GAFCON chairman, Laurent Mabanda of Rwanda? Okay. And just well, so people know, I made a typo in a little article. Somebody pointed did? this out. Thank you. Um, okay. Foley Beach was not what well, completed his term as gafcon chairman why was he not re-elected well his tenure as archbishop of the acna concludes june of 2024 that's right next year i had type 23 
in the article. And therefore, he wasn't eligible to serve a full five-year term as head chairman of GAFCON. Laurent Mabanda of Rwanda, who has the whole five years ahead of him, is the chairman. And the vice chairman is Miguel Uchoa of Brazil and Kanishka Rafael of Australia, of Sydney. Well, Kanishka is not a primate. Give it time. Give it time. They're going to give him time. <laughs> give it time. Well, okay, so now... In reaction to what happened in Kigali, I want to know who's on board. And you told me that, you know, you talked to people from uh, Holy Church in Brompton who seem to be on board. And that's big to me because they're kind of the type of people that they have too much to lose if they make the wrong choice. Yeah, the, one of the speakers from the platform was a woman of African descent who is a church commissioner with, mm -hmm. of the Church of England, which is one of the people that run Holy manages the money she spoke from the platform about the holy trinity brompton and the alpha movement and alpha's planting of churches and the alpha network they're on board now alpha is not moving out of the church of england they are not declaring war but they are and but this is why they're able to be part of the gafcon movement because gafcon's a mission it's not htb is not signed up to the cairo covenant HDB has signed up to the Kigali commitment to do and to uh, Ben Kwashi's list of these are the objectives we want. Youth ministry, evangelism, education, discipleship, mission. So, you know, HTB was there. The Church Society, Lee Gaddis, they, they were on board. Rob Monroe, the uh, Bishop of Ebbsfleet, he was on board. Um, it really was a good outcome. Uh, yes, there were the late night meeting of British groups. Kevin and I in Jerusalem got kicked out of one of those meetings. And, uh, after and walking, Gavin was allowed. Well, we, we walked a, a mile to get there uh, and they kicked hot. us out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and Gavin was allowed to stay in. And then he said, hey, it wasn't worth coming. Uh, <laughs> it wasn't worth going. <laughs> well, the English had their little grumble, grumble, secret, secret meeting. Uh, Church of England Evangelical Council's on board. Mm -hmm. um, the They called eggs uh, evangelical group of general synod that's right yeah. the english come up with the worst gafcon i've never liked that name the conservative grouping from general synod they call eggs evangelical group of general synod. yeah yeah it makes sense but come on what a dumb name excuse me i'm sorry but uh, well if the name's before. okay it's the acronym we're having trouble with okay calvin robinson came on board at the end uh, as he saw, I'm not saying he his mood changed or mind changed, but rather his needs and desires for his ministry and his work will be met and fulfilled by the work of GAFCON. Sure. And by the way, Calvin's getting his own TV station on GB News. Tucker Carlson uh, gets fired. <laughs> Gavin, Calvin at Robinson goes up. So well, who knows? Well, Don, Don Lemon got fired. Uh, Tucker Carlson got fired. Now, here, you know it's the end times if tomorrow you turn on CNN and Tucker Carlson's there and you turn to Fox News and Don Lemon's over there. Then then you know it's over. So, <laughs> Well, you don't, get, you don't get Fox News at the TV. CNN International must pay people to carry their channel. Because the yes, only place yeah. I see it is in airports and, ho and hotels. Yeah. But uh, I was reading uh, my news feed as I came back and Tucker Carlson had an interview with Robert F. Kennedy Jr. And for all the world, it sounded like Tucker Carlson was pushing for the Kennedy to be, you know, to take that. I mean, you know, cats and dogs getting married. We have, yeah, and I, somebody wrote to me and said, wouldn't it be great to have a Trump Kennedy uh, oh, no. ticket, a Republican and a Democrat? And I'm thinking, worlds are in collision. <laughs> it's like, uh, no. Apparently, there's a black hole somewhere sucking up planets on the other side of the universe. We could use that here now. You know, th things are looking bleak, except for GAFCON, which is going to take on a different mission in its role in, in Anglicanism and its role in the world. And it's it's nice to see that because we've seen other types of uh, ministries try to transition, and it doesn't work well. And I come back to something I said at the very beginning. I really was struck all through Lent. I was at, I've been asking the Lord to give me a sense of inner humility, uh, because one of the sins I work with is pride. 
surprise, surprise. I'm sure nobody would have guessed that one. Uh, and when I went to GAFCON and all these people, I don't want to, I don't want to say a hundred thousand, but because there are only 1300 people, but hundreds of people came up to me and spoke to me. Oh, Karen Love, the wife of Bill Love, says, Bill comes into the bedroom all the time and sees me watching you on TV. And I'm thinking, I don't want to know that, Mrs. Love. I mean, ew, ew, cooties, ew, gross. And, and, his, <laughs> and, and, his, and Bishop Love says, oh, she's your greatest fan. I never knew that. All the primates, except for people saying, hello, Kevin, where's George? Uh, that was a few dozen times. Well, but yeah, we all here. these brand new get all these brand new Acne bishops who I've never met in person, Doma, mm -hmm. Pittsburgh. Uh, I've never actually met. Chip. I met Chip Edgar twenty odd years ago at an Acne thing or a, a ACN thing. But sure, uh, we they came up to me and we began conversations as if we had just finished talking an hour earlier, and they knew me and they and I. Well, I need to pray for some more humility because it it is humbling that people care about us and the work we do and thank us for it. Yeah, I, in my travels, even from Florida to um, Wisconsin last week, we stopped at three different churches on the way up and people watch the program. They know, they talk, and they, they want to introduce themselves. And here they do. They start that conversation as if I know them as well as they know me. And that's the most humbling thing in the world because that's God using this program and putting us in a place where it's beyond our control. Uh, we are out of our comfort zone, you know. I do have a funny little story I want to share. And sure. it's a sweet story. It's not a bad story. I went on a city double-deck bus tour of Kigali the first morning of the conference before it started. And there was a lovely woman about 10, 15 years younger than I was sitting next to me. And we chatted. Her name was Sue. And and uh, she, uh, uh, I asked, you know, what capacity was she here? She said, oh, her husband was the dean, brand new dean of a seminary in the United States. I said, oh, which one? Trinity Seminary. And you know, oh, wonderful. I said, you know, my mother was a trustee back in the John Rogers days in the 70s mm -hmm. and whatnot. And we chatted, and she obviously had no idea who I was, never saw Anglican Inc. before. And we had a lovely time. Yeah. And later I met her husband, and he looked at me like, what did my wife tell you? That's what right. is she, what, what, what is, am I going to hear from people from Anglican <laughs> Inc. about, Anglican Unscripted, about the latest scandals of, uh, no, no, spam. <sighs> it was just, you know, just a lovely social time. But I thought that was funny because it, it uh, that reputation, where I guess, can go both ways. No, it can. But our success is obviously our friendship, obviously our ability to observe the news that's going on around us and report it in an understandable, cohesive way. Um, you don't find that in a lot of programs in the relig in religious uh, parlance. However, my biggest news story, GAFCON here, Global South, no merger, but they're going to uh, change roles is that Anglican liturgy has invaded the Roman Catholic Church, George. And I, I yeah, want to talk about this have... because Pope Francis is a wannabe Anglican, and now you know. Yeah, you and I have been saying for years he's a closet Episcopalian, and now we know <laughs> it's true. Oh, uh, if people are not familiar with this story, just turn on any Catholic blog and you will see howls of outrage. Um, last week, uh, the Bishop of Fulham, Jonathan Baker, is the uh, flying bishop for the Diocese of London, and he has the Fulham Episcopal area. And that's not a geographic area, even though Fulham is part of London, but rather it's for clergy who cannot, you know, Anglo-Catholics, who cannot accept the administration of women, priests, and whatnot. And every few years, uh, the Episcopal area clergy uh, have to gather for a clergy conference. And this year they saved up their money and they went to Rome and they stayed at a villa owned by the Venerable English College, which is an English Catholic seminary in London. It's about 500 years old. And they had lectures there. And then they were able 
to celebrate Holy Communion at St. John's Lateran Cathedral, which is the seat, the chair of the Pope. St. Peter's is not the Pope's cathedral. It is his That's cathedral, correct, all yeah. his cathedrals. But <laughs> his seat as the Bishop of Rome is the Lateran. And then after a papal audience, they had a, Jonathan Baker met the Pope and they gathered there were about 30 clergy. And this was all on Facebook. They're all excited. And we saw pictures of what they were eating and what they were watching and what they were doing. And, you know, just sort of Anglo-Catholics having a, a Catholic-y time in Rome. Well, you would have thought that maidens were being sacrificed on the altars. There's this one blogger, a uh, video blogger called Taylor Marshall. And I think uh -huh. originally he was a Fort, per Fort, P Fort Worth Pierce about 20 years ago. And he joined okay. the Catholic Church and he said, look, the Pope is as evil as I've been saying. He allows these Anglicans and Jonathan Baker is the bishop who's famous for being divorced and remarried and having been a Freemason. And he mm -hmm. may still be, we don't know. A lot, and it's a Freemason divorced bishop to celebrate at the Pope's Holy Cathedral using Catholic Eucharistic vessels as if Jonathan Baker has cooties and they now have to be burned or something and allowing Anglicans to serve, worship. And I'm thinking, why, why, you know, apart from maybe some psychological traumas this guy had, why is he gone so bananas? And then other outlets sort of repeated this. And Gavin Ashton, did our friend, gave a uh, interview. Passioned, and he, passioned interview. Passioned, passioned interview. address yes. on this point. Yeah. Now, I have been to at least four or five Anglican consecrations in the United States held in Roman Catholic cathedrals. I can't it, tell it, you it, how many times I've been to clergy conferences yeah. at Catholic retreat centers. Yeah. Jim Hobby was consecrated in a Roman Catholic church. Uh, and so we didn't the, have to bring our own ch chalices or and no. we brought our own vestments, but we didn't have yeah. to bring anything with us. Yeah. So I don't see, so from an American perspective, this is old news. Yeah. And I know, formed a church plant in 2008 in the basement of a Roman Catholic church in Watertown, Connecticut. And there have been times, I mean, I remember one story I did for Living Church years ago, a Catholic church was knocked down someplace in the Midwest by a tornado, and they were allowed to worship in the Episcopal church mm -hmm. um, in that little town until they were able to get back on their feet. But for Catholic purists, evidently this uh, violated some aspect of canon law. I'm not familiar with what exactly, but the next well, day, the vicar of that church said, oh, Failure of communication here, like he's the warden and cool hand Luke. What we have is a failure to communicate. Uh, it, when Gavin was on our show, we would have these talks about the holiness of buildings, that there was something intrinsic sure, yeah. and special. And I took the point, it's nothing holy about a building. What's holy is the Holy Spirit and Christ. And that can be in a field, in a building. And I can tell you there's some Episcopal churches that I have entered where the Holy Spirit left a long time ago. <laughs> well, I th let's, are... you know, let's be clear. Once the tabric was for, uh, torn at the temple, um, that was it. Okay, we don't have magic buildings anymore. Yeah. And there is a stream of Catholicism, those who are really keen into archic and ecumenicalism that say, sure, wonderful, let's do something. And while you're here, let's do it. There was no mistake of communications. They just are trying to uh, calm the raging seas of the people who are most exercised are the converts from Anglicanism. Yeah. Because as Taylor Marshall said, why did I go through? Why did I give up my priesthood? Why did I? Why did I? Why did I? If now Anglicans can worship at an altar that they won't allow to be used for the Latin Mass or this uh, society of Paul the Tenth. Um, St. Paul the Tenth, you know, the Catholic traditionalists can't do it, but they'll let Anglicans. The next day or the next Sunday, they allow the Coptic Orthodox uh, primate to uh, celebrate there. I, I hear and appreciate the anger, but I just think when I see that degree of passion, I have to ask myself, what's going on here? Well, and as Anglicans, we won't understand that passion for uh, 
modern day temples. We, it's just not part of our theology or doctrine. And in my parlance, good. I don't need to understand that. You know, I so I, I can observe it and talk about it. That's about it. George, well, this has Kevin, been. Kevin, yeah, I, I got to go oh, say that. Uh, Maybe I can understand it this way. When they tore down the old Cameron Indoor Stadium where Duke basketball was, you could buy little pieces of the floor uh, for $1,000 or something, you know, as a souvenir, and they sold out immediately. So maybe this is not just a Catholic thing. Maybe there are some sacred spaces for people. Yeah. Uh, Duke basketball, uh, Yankee Stadium, I don't know. Maybe. This has been episode, I'll let you do that part, we haven't done a show for so long, I forget my own parts. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And this is episode 800 of Anglican Unscripted.